Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 10 at County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage. Or you can visit us at gbcportage.com for more information about the church and get links for our live streams. Today we continue a sermon series on the church with Pastor Jeremy Edmondson. And before we jump in, while you're turning to Genesis 12, I feel it's very important to pray again. I got a lot of things to share with you today. And I'm very excited about it, uh, but I also have a time commitment. So let's take a moment. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we pray that you would illuminate the scripture for our understanding, that you would help us to grasp the importance of what it is to see how you have structured your word and how you have told us all about what history entails. Father, give us wisdom. May the spirit be our teacher. Illuminate the text to our hearts. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We are covering dispensations. Uh, It's interesting because sometimes when you talk about the idea of dispensations with some people, they frown upon it. They think it's a waste of time. They think that you've uh, made a mountain out of a molehill and and those types of things. You're being nitpicky about your theology or, oh, you're one of those Christians kind of thing. uh, Out of the ordinary or or, um, not really concerned with the main thing. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that if we don't understand dispensations, we don't understand how to interpret God's word. And so you will find yourself getting into all heaps of a mess of trouble, pulling verses from the Old Testament that have no bearing today. Uh, Somehow somebody's found their pet peeve verses in Leviticus that they love to throw upon other people, not realizing that that's not for the church. And so in order to rightly divide God's word, in order to rightly understand God's word, we have to understand God's word, how God made it understandable. Would you agree? How many people like it when they misconstrue what you've said? No one likes that. Do See, that hits home with us, okay? I promise you this, God's heart is the same in that type of situation. In fact, we could do this. I, I bet you, you guys ever heard the telephone game? Yeah. yeah? Start something up here with Zach, and let's just pass it around. And when it gets over here to Jerry, we'll find out what I said. You think that's going to come out clear? Probably not. I'm going to say Jesus Christ is king, and Jerry's going to come up with, don't forget to get bread before you go home. (laughs) That's usually how those things end. Somehow they get garbled over time. God has revealed himself plainly, and he wants us to know him. So let me refresh a little bit, just in case we're not all up to speed or where we need to be. Number one, what is a dispensation? A dispensation is a stewardship of time. It is not necessarily a time period. People often want to say, well, it's from this time to this time, and that's the only time that it is, and we regulate it to time only. It's not. Time is just what helps us understand where the dispensation falls into place. But what a dispensation is, is it's actually a stewardship. It is a requirement that God is placing upon the human race, his creation, in response to his goodness. That's the whole idea. The universe is God's house. It's how he wants to set the rules. And because he is God, because he is the creator, we are the creatures, he is the only one that is entitled to make those rules. We have the responsibility to respond to those rules. Now, one thing that is common, I don't know, a mishap that I find when I talk with people about dispensations is we talk about, well, we we believe that commonly there's seven dispensations. Oh, so you believe that there's seven different ways to be saved? No. You're reading salvation into a stewardship of time. The stewardship of time has nothing to do with salvation. Do people get saved during those stewardships of time? Yes, they do. But they get saved the exact same way that anybody gets saved at any time in history. And that is by faith alone, in the person of Jesus Christ alone, period. That's it. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It doesn't sound like that there was a different way for him to be saved other than faith alone. So that never changes. The responsibility that God places upon man is to show us our neediness. Nobody likes that, do they? Did you ever come to church thinking that you would be called needy today? Does that sound like a fun thing? I'm not needy, I have everything. Usually that gets a man right in his ego, doesn't it? Sadly, sometimes for us men, our ego becomes our Christ. And it's not. It's not. 
So when we get to Genesis chapter 12, we're seeing a change in dispensation. Let's recap what we've seen so far. Number one, the dispensation of innocence. Don't eat of the tree. They eat of the tree. The judgment is that now work is going to be hard. Bearing children is going to be hard. They're cast out of the garden. But they're spared because something else died in order to cover their sin. That's grace. Then we dealt with the idea of innocence. And what is the dispensation of innocence? I'm sorry, conscience. The dispensation of conscience is, is now that they've eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, every single person is now born with an understanding of good and evil. And you can now make that choice. The problem is, is that when we as people vacate our rightful position as creations under God's headship as the creator, we begin to do what is right in our own eyes. And when we do what is right in our own eyes, we always choose evil continually. In fact, we're going to see an instance of this today in some of the scriptures we're going to look look at. But I think it's important for me to go ahead and prepare you and let you know, just as a general rule of thumb, and if you don't get anything else out of this, if you're looking for an application point, here it is. The decisions that are made in life that are based on convenience are always wrong ones. God's word is never set forward to where, well, how does this benefit you and how is this most convenient for you? I guarantee you that's always the wrong decision. God's way is rarely convenient, but it is always right. And it always develops the man or woman of God for maturity. He doesn't check with us to find out how we feel about it. Why? Because that's what's usually driving our train. That's not what obedience is founded on. It's founded upon fact. We'll see some of that today. What we find out is that conscience doesn't work to govern man as a stewardship. Why is that? Because the thoughts and the intents of the heart are only evil continually. And so God sends in a judgment, the flood. But in his grace, he saved eight people out on the other side of it. Then they established civil government. Life for a life. You are to multiply, spread out, fill the earth. What do we decide to do in exchange? We want to gather in one place, and we want to build a tower and a name for ourselves. We want to be king. We want to be on top. And so what does God do? He judges by confusing the languages and spreading out the people. How does he spare them? Well, here's the interesting thing. Sin deserves what? Death. And the sheer fact that we have ancestors that guaranteed our existence here is an act of grace. can't take life for granted, guys. It's an act of grace. So now God's going to do something different. We've read this before, but I want you to see the particulars of it. You may remember some of this from the foundational framework series. In chapter 12, look at verses 1 through 3. It says here, Now Yahweh said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. Now we didn't cover this too long ago. It was the idea of the Abrahamic covenant. And remember, what was promised to Abraham is unconditional in the form of land, seed or descendants, and worldwide blessing. Now let's watch this because verse 3 is the one we need to pay close attention to. I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. In other words, you are to be a blessing to others. Now watch what it says here, verse 3. Pay close attention, guys. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. Now, what's interesting is the word bless is the exact same word in both instances, but the word curse is not. So notice the promise that's made forward. This is the dispensation of promise. And I don't think the promise is so much the promise made to Abraham about land, seed, and blessing. That's the Abrahamic covenant. That's a contract that is established that is unconditional in nature. The promise is blessing and cursing. Let's look over it again. And I will bless those who bless you. This is a divine promise. And here's what this does is this makes us think long and hard about how we treat the people of Israel and the anti-Semitism that goes on in the world. Because look at the next one. And the one who kalals you, I will are. Now, Pastor Steve, correct my Hebrew tomorrow. Because I'm not good at it. And there were no gutturals, so I didn't have to (laughs) any of that stuff in there. Anybody ever heard anybody speak Hebrew? I've got a CD of a guy singing it. It's amazingly atrocious in some ways, but it's beautiful. 
because there's a lot of... <laughs> Sounds like somebody's got a cold. It's bad. But regardless, there are two different Hebrew words that are used here. The first one, kalal or kalel, is the idea of belittling someone. It's actually formed from the word that means to make small. It's actually the idea of talking down to someone, speaking crossways towards them, making them to be less than what they are, viewing them as something that is insignificant and pitily is the idea. But the second one is, and you, that that person who does that, I will curse. This idea is to ban or to place under a curse or to bind a curse to them. In other words, it is a lasting judgment that sticks. Now think about this. The first use of the word curse is attitude towards Israel. The second one is recompense for that attitude. Does everybody see that? And that's in both situations. Whether you bless or whether you belittle, the recompense out of that is to be blessed for blessing or to be cursed for belittling them. Does everybody see that? Yes? Yes. Who's awake this morning? See, here's the beautiful thing about me having a pulpit in front of us. (laughs) When my points fall flat, that's what they teach you in preaching school. You beat on the pulpit to let them know that at least you meant it, and they should have got it. So now you guys feel weird, weird. Did I miss something? Yes. There you go. Now, here's what's interesting. If you have the ESV version, you will notice that that first instance of curse is actually translated dishonors. Another good version that has come out is called the Holman Christian Standard Version. It actually says, I will curse those who treat you with contempt. That's a really good rendering of what's going on here. In other words, anyone who belittles or treats with contempt The people of Israel, the descendants of Abram, will be cursed. This is the requirement of this dispensation. Now, if you've got your chart, you look at your chart and you write down on there that this dispensation is the dispensation of promise. When does it take place? Well, it starts in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. But in particular, the emphasis needs to be laid upon verse 3. Verse 3 is the crux issue. Now, up until this week, I have always taught this dispensation as God is pulling away from the world at large and he is placing the dispensation in the hands of a small little race of people that he's beginning from scratch and that starts with Abram. I was wrong. And so if that's what I taught in the foundational framework series, I am wrong because what I realize now is actually Israel is the requirement in this dispensation. The dispensation still holds true for the requirement of worldwide. How are we as individuals, as nations, as a whole, treating Israel? Now, you guys know my fondness for politics. But praise Jesus Christ for Harry Truman. Because when Israel came back together as a nation, and for some reason America's opinion always matters in situations, he upheld their right to be called a nation once again in 1948. Now this created immediate revolt from the Arabs, but praise God that our nation at that time stood in a declaration to where we were on the side of blessing rather than cursing. If you want to know how the United States of America gets in hot water, It's not because we haven't murdered enough children. We've already done that. It's not because we don't have enough fraud spreading around. And yeah, sin is that serious. We need to call it what it is. But our stance in relation to the nation of Israel matters so much in the eyes of God that he elicited a promise and a requirement for us to uphold. Because the American church has gotten away from dispensations, we have forgotten this responsibility. And so we have a privilege and a requirement and a responsibility to stand by the Jewish people. That's why organizations like Jews for Jesus are so vitally important today. And you would be amazed how many Christians disregard them and run them out. Why? Well, the reason is, is because the church has replaced Israel. And so God doesn't need you anymore. Now, let me be clear on this. That's the devil's theology. 
the idea that God is done with Israel is insanely unbiblical. And you have to twist Scripture to come to that end. Now, if that doesn't mean a big deal to you today or right now, I hope that it will by the end of this sermon and you will see the significance of why this is important. Because here's the thing. If it's top priority on God's heart, it should be top priority on ours as well. I think that's important. So the question is blessing and cursing and how are we going to react in those situations? Now, I want to show you some interesting things about this. If you've got a pen, please document with me how this unfolds. If you've got your little booklet on the church, does anybody need a booklet to take notes on? You would like to have one? Zach, would you care? You're such a fast guy. I appreciate that. They're back there on the back next to where the handouts are. Just one. Who else needs one? We get this taken care of. While Zach's doing that gracious act of service of which he will be rewarded before the Bema seat, let's all go to Psalm 89. If you don't know what the Bema is, come to Sunday school at Pete's class. Psalm 89. Turn with me to Psalm 89. This entire psalm could stand to be meditated on, broken down throughout your week, maybe prayed through, just getting it saturating in our minds. But I want to draw your attention to just a few things that really stand out here. Just up front with Barb right here, Zach. Thank you so much. Psalm 89. We're going to start in verse 28 and go to 37. If you want to write down where these are, you don't necessarily want to write it down in your chart, but I want to show you some things about this promise that has been made and some of the ramifications that come from it. So what is the requirement? The requirement is how we treat Israel and how Israel treats us. That's an important point. Don't think for a second that Israel is somehow off the hook. They were told to be a blessing as well. And here's the thing. Does that mean that when we support Israel, we're supposed to support their sin? No, God didn't support their sin. God chastised them for their sin. He rebuked them for their sin. He judged them for their sin. But as far as God's purposes for Israel, that is the test in front of us. Okay? So now, take a look at Psalm 89. We're going to start in verse 28. It says, My loving kindness I will keep for him forever. Now, if you say, who in the world are we talking about? Well, we're talking about Israel in particular. But if you go back to verse 20, you'll see I have found David my servant. Okay. So the idea of David as the promised king, we know from first Samuel, uh, or sorry, second Samuel chapter seven, that we're dealing with the idea of the Davidic covenant would be there. But David is a representative of the Jewish people. Okay. So notice it says in verse 28, my loving kindness, my loyal love, I will keep for him how long? Pay attention to that language, guys. And my covenant, my contract shall be confirmed to him. Verse 29, so I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Now watch this. Here's the sin part. If his sin, sorry, if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Does it sound like that even though they're God's chosen people, he treats them lightly? No, in fact, it's because they are his chosen people that he disciplines them. In fact, the scripture tells us you don't discipline a son that you don't really love. You only care about them doing wrong when you absolutely love them because you want better for them. That's the reason why we should be disciplining our children. Because we desire for right and better ways than what they choose. It's no different with how God is a parent to the nation of Israel. Verse 33, but I will not break off my loyal love, my loving kindness from him, nor deal falsely in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate. Does everybody see that? I will not violate, and watch this, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Now, in an ever-changing world, here's what God's telling you. My promise I made to Israel, I will not change. This doesn't change. It can't be altered. It can't be misconstrued. We're not going to put an appendage at the end of it or anything like that. It stands just exactly as God has said it. Verse 35, once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. It cannot be altered. His descendants shall endure how long? Forever. And his throne as the sun before me, it shall be established forever like the moon. And the witness in the sky is faithful. In other words, as long as the sun and moon continue, the descendants of David will continue. Now, here's the thing. 
Some of you remember this. I don't remember this. I'm way far removed from this. Say what you want about how horrible Hitler is, and it's true. I don't know if there's enough words in the English language to describe how terrible he is. If you've, ever, if you've got Netflix, you can watch a, a documentary. It's called Night Will Fall. It's an amazing, humbling documentary that they actually hired film crews to come in to oversee and, and to document for the American people at the time the cleanup of the death camps. It's incredible. It's humbling. It's sobering. And for some reason, they shelved that footage and didn't even bring it out till a couple of years ago. They polished it up and finally released it. It's very well done, but it's scary. Don't recommend you watching it with your children at all. Watch it, screen it for yourselves. It's only an hour and 20 minutes long. It's worth your time. Night will fall. It's worth watching. It's humbling. Say what you want about Hitler, but he was persuasive. And here's one thing that we know. The Jews should have been extinct during that time. As vicious and as ravenous as he was about ethnic cleansing, about racism essentially is what it was, they should have died. The only thing that kept them from that was God's promise. And I think that's one thing we have to remember. If there is a testimony that there is a God, so many people wander around looking up in the sky. Is there a God? Is there a God? Has anybody seen these videos of these kid, these college kids all dressed up with their hair and ponytails pointing at broccoli in the middle of the street so nobody can get to work? What is wrong with our nation, man? Somebody give them a better education than that. Good grief. Pointing at broccoli. You're bad. Who knows? That's what drugs do to you guys. Stay away from them. Our nation has got some problems. And I think it's because we forgot the main thing. It's a main thing. There is a God who holds his promises steadfast and sure. And Israel testifies throughout history. Of the faithfulness of God. Sometimes we forget that. He tells us right here in his word. I won't alter that promise. I'm not changing anything. My word is steadfast. I'll tell you this. If you can't trust God's word, you have nothing. There is nothing sure or certain in this world. And if you can't trust God's word, and if for somehow it changes, you can't trust him either. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. What makes Israel so special And this calling out of Abraham and setting them aside. If they are the requirement, if we're supposed to care about them, encourage them, build them up, pray for them. You see those bumper stickers, right? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Every one of us should do that. Add that to your prayer list in the morning. Every one of us, before you go to bed at night, throw it in there. I promise you God likes it. How about Deuteronomy chapter 7? Look at verse 6. Here's what Moses tells them, very revealing. For you are a holy people to Yahweh, your Elohim. And notice what it says. Yahweh, your Elohim, has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And if you're consistent with the use of the word possession throughout the book of Deuteronomy, you find out, for those of you in Deuteronomy class, don't make me look bad here, possession means what? Inheritance. Israel is God's inheritance. Or let's say it this way. In the end of time, that's what God gets. Now think about that for a second. God is so interested and loves people that people are what he gets as an inheritance when it's all said and done. That's a personal God. Look what it says after that, verse 7. Yahweh did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were fewest of all peoples. It's not because you had great strength and he thought there's really something good there to work with so we can move forward with that. God's not concerned with quantity. He's concerned with quality. Look what he says in verse 8. But because the Lord, what? Loved you. Why are the Jews chosen people of God? Because God loves them. Period. That's all the reason he needs. That's all the incentive he needs to keep his promise. It's because God has a love that is everlasting, that never quits, never diminishes, and never stops. He is always loving. Look what it says. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. That's this covenant with Abraham that we saw in Genesis 12. 
He says here, Yahweh brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that Yahweh, your Elohim, he is Elohim, the faithful Elohim, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now watch this. But repays those who hate him to their faces. Destroys them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment and the statutes and the judgments which I'm commanding you today to do them. Does that sound like a blessing and blessing and cursing and cursing situation? It very much does. Now, here's the interesting thing. When does this curse take place? Turn with me to Exodus 1. And we're doing just dandy on time, so don't anybody worry about it. That means don't turn around and look at the clock. Within this dispensation, we see a very real situation take place. In fact, it's so real and it's so profound That whereas before God would identify himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, once this Exodus event takes place, he now refers to himself afterward as the God who delivered Israel from Egypt. That's what a massive undertaking this is. Now, if we think back historically, Egypt is the world's superpower. There's no one greater than them. There is no one mightier. No one has a bigger army. No one has a more educated society. No one has more conquered territory. The reign of Pharaoh is fierce. And for no other reason than all the people that were Egyptians esteemed him to be a god in the flesh. So now you've got this psychological demonic buy-in that is further manipulating people to uphold a man much greater than what he should ever be. Look at chapter 1 verse 5. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph died and all of his brothers and all that generation, but the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now, if you remember this, Joseph was already in Egypt. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. He later on has an interaction with his brothers and eventually invites them and his father to come over and they set up shop in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh cares for them, loves them. They're able to find work. They're able to prosper. But then Jacob passes away. Joseph passes away. Time takes place and look what happens as they grow and they grow. Verse 8, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And that's interesting because it's not like the Egyptians didn't keep good records. In fact, they kept such great records that when the exodus happened, they made sure to expunge that event from most of their historical accounts, except for one. And I don't know if you've ever read about this, but it'll send goosebumps up your arms. You guys call them goosebumps here? Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Sometimes we call them chili bumps. I don't know. But they, goose flesh, whatever. Goose pimples. Anyway. They actually excavated about 20 years ago one of the tombs there in a pyramid. And they were looking through in civilization how certain people had died. And they actually found an inscription that said, This one child was the firstborn of Pharaoh, and he was taken by the God of the Hebrews. Yeah, that's cool. Can you imagine why the Egyptians didn't want you to know that? Because they didn't like to admit defeat. In their minds, they're always the superpower. In fact, here's what's interesting. After this Exodus event, you don't really hear of Egypt again in Scripture until 1 Kings 14. That's how long it took them to recover historically from the blow that God gave against them. Because why? They belittled Israel and they were judged. What's that? How many years did you say that? Oh, at least 700 I think it's 700. I want to say the time of the Exodus was around 1440 is what they have. You would have had the time of David's rule in 900. But I can't place 1 Kings 14 in my head for some reason because after Solomon, there's so many kings in both kingdoms. It's it's crazy. So uh, it's worth a Google. Okay. 
Thank you for joining us for Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 10 at County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage, Wisconsin. Or you can visit us at gbcportage.com for more information about the church and to get links for our live streams. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace.